Hey guys, Pastor Matt here. Um, one of our visions at the Village Church is we want to be a place that resources liberally the Big C Church of Jesus Christ. And if by his grace we might leave a kingdom legacy with those resources, we want to be all about that. And so thanks for watching this sermon or preparing to watch this sermon. I, I'm praying that you're watching this in community, in conjunction with your ongoing discipleship at a local church. And if, by the grace of God, this becomes one of those things that continues to build up your faith, encourage your walk, fuel your love for Jesus, would you consider giving to the ministries of the Village Church? It's actually really simple. You could either do it in the app or you can go to thevillagechurch.net backslash give and do it there. I hope that the next chunk of time as you watch this sermon, you find your affections for Jesus soaring you find courage flood back into your bones, and you fall more deeply in love with Jesus than you are at this moment. God bless you. Hey guys, Pastor Matt here. What what a moment we find ourselves in. We've had a couple of these uh, in, in my 21 years here as pastor, and this one feels really significant to me. Uh, I wanna take a second, just, just a moment, and explain where we got the title for this campaign, Beyond. Um, if you've paid attention to the 2030 vision, you'll, you'll find a, a sentence in there about how we wanna be a community of faith that lives beyond ourselves. What we mean by this sentence is, is like true to our history and really relying on the faithfulness of God, we want to continue to be a place that thinks about his kingdom first, not our own brand, not, not what we can get for ourselves here, but really what might be available beyond us. And then we added the tagline for generations to come. And there were a couple of reasons we added that tagline. First, we want to be a church that has space for every age and stage of life, all generations invited into this place. And, and then secondly, we want to remember and then pay forward that all the goodness that God has done in our lives and in this place for this community really was built not by us, but by the generosity and prayerfulness of those who were before us in this place. And now it's our turn to prayerfully and generously give towards what will live on after us. And we believe that in order to become this kind of place in on this corner, we are in desperate need of more space. We need education space for our children and adults. We're not just a church that meets on Sunday mornings. We meet throughout the week and we can feel the tension and stress of our continual growth as we seek to love and minister in this community. Hey, I'm excited just to share with you some key priorities that we have for the Beyond campaign, namely three key priorities. The first being the next generation. We're excited to create and designate space for not only the church of today, but the church of tomorrow, the next generation. And so we're building and designing and planning and preparing 
I'm excited for this space to be used to train up, raise up, and communicate to the next generation. We love them, we believe in them, and we believe that they were made for the day and the day was made for them. The second priority is the priority that we have around a multi-purpose space, a multi-purpose venue right here on this campus. Uh, really a, a venue that will hold about 500 people that we can use for a variety of ministry offerings and options, uh, weddings, funerals. It's gonna be a really uh, spectacular space uh, designed to be versatile uh, for a diverse set of ministry uses. That's our second priority. And then our third priority is this. So we, we want to be, and you hear us say it all the time, we wanna be a welcoming home. And so we'll do that with an expanded foyer, some new color schemes in the sanctuary, uh, new outdoor venues and places to sit, to gather, to linger, to be together. But we're saying this, hey, welcome home, welcome home. And we're doing all of this for generations to come. So what's it cost? This project overall will cost us about $50 million. And here's the ask. Sacrificial faith and action. Sacrificial faith and action. And that's what we ask you, to consider what does God require of you? He's gonna require the same thing of you that he requires of me, sacrificial faith and action. Not just, just enough faith, but sacrificial faith and not passive faith that, oh, somebody, uh, somebody else will take care of it, but active faith, sacrificial faith and action. What does it look like for me and for you to pick up our cross and follow after Jesus in this project? That's the ask. Now, how will we accomplish this mission? Well, well, this is one of the more significant moments in the history of our church, easily uh, the biggest campaign and biggest project that we've ever had. This is going to require more leaders, more volunteers, a generosity with our resources, specifically our finances, that, that really we we haven't done in, in my 21 years as the pastor. I mean, we've had moments, if you think back on, we need $4 million in 30 days. And then for, for the place that we sit in now, it was a $10 million retrofit. And, and God has repeatedly made a way. And so here we are at the end of this quick video into this campaign. And I'm so pumped to watch God do it again, to watch God through you, through me, through the men and women of this family of faith, sacrificially and generously give to this worthy campaign and call on our lives in this moment of history. Good morning, my name is Tom Kite. My wife, Billy, and I serve in Connections and are home group leaders, and I also help in the finance group, in the care group, and in production. Today's uh, scripture reading is in Matthew 6, 25 to 33. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his, own, his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek that all of these things and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and grab those. That will be our passage for today. Uh, about a year and a half ago, 
Uh, I got a phone call from a friend of mine who uh, has multiple different jobs. I, don't, I think everybody knows a guy like that. It's like, now what do you do? And he does like six things. And um, one of the things that, that he does is he runs this like Christian adventure travel thing. And uh, so he, he said, hey, I'm, I'm wondering if you would be interested in this. Uh, I'm putting together uh, a cruise uh, in like a 42-room sail yacht out of Istanbul to visit uh, like the, the letters to the churches. I, like we're going to go to Ephesus, we're going to go to Philippi, we're going to go to Patmos. And I would love for you and Lauren to pray about and consider, we'll fly you to Istanbul, we'll put you at a nice hotel, we'll get you a room on this sail yacht. And for about 25 to 30 minutes in the mornings as we, before we get off the boat on Ephesus, could you give us an overview of Ephesians? And if we get an overview of Philippians, an overview of the book of Revelation. Now, you need to hear me say that if I'm ever outside of this place, outside of my home, ministering in other places, it is a prayerful, let's look at the calendar, let's, let's see if this works according to our priorities kind of decision for us. I also want you to know that I did none of that before I said yes to his offer. Uh, I did not pray. I did not look at the calendar to see where the kids would be. I didn't look at our calendar to see what was going on here. I said, this is an invitation too good to say no to. It's not going to happen again, I don't think. And so you're telling me you're going to fly me and my wife over to Istanbul. You're going to put us in a nice hotel. You're going to put me on a 42-room sail yacht later in the day. Sea cloud two. Look at that. It'll blow your mind. Like nothing about that experience fits the tax bracket I will ever be in. And you're saying you want to pay for me, not, not pay me, but pay for me and Lauren to do that. Yes. And then I said, Lord, would you, okay. And then we started looking at the calendar and there was some stuff with the kids. And so I called my in-laws and we're like, hey, um, guys, real quick. Do you think for about 12 days, you could, no, okay, well then we'll split time here and here. And we just made it work. And if you're like, hey, bro, on the middle of a campaign like this, I don't know that you should be starting out with your bougie trips. Well, okay, um, here's what I'm trying to do with even that story. The invitation was an invitation that we were going to figure out how to say yes to. It, it was too good, too big of an opportunity for us to say, ah, man, I'm just not sure. Like, listen, bro, I didn't even ask the dates. I just said, yeah, and then went back and said, okay, starting from yes, how do we make this work? Well, here, I don't know if you've ever been a part of anything like we're doing right now. Here's my whole plan for the next five weeks to perpetually call you into life and meaning and purpose. That, that's all you're going to hear me do. I, I want to celebrate the moment of history that we're in. I want to rejoice that we've been called according to his purposes. I want to all the more, as I've done for 21 years, woo you in into an understanding of God's love for you and the opportunity that sits in front of you for life, real life, 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 and for your purposes to be found and lived into. Now, with that said, let's look at this passage. Therefore, this is Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food? So in that little phrase, now we've got what Jesus is after. Is not life more? more than, and he's going to use that refrain about food, about clothes, about worry, about anxiety, is not life more than, is a key part of this passage. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and your heavenly Father feeds them. And I, and I wonder if you believe what Jesus is about to say are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more 
clothe you, O you of little faith. Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. And verse 33 is the solution for anxiety, depression, fear, worry, the whole gamut of psychological issues that plagues us. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. So, so here's my outline for you type A'ers. See, I just want to make you, help you breathe. All right? We're going to cover your story, our story, and then the story. So there's your outline, right? Uh, your story, uh, our story, and, and then the story. So let's start with your story. You did not spontaneously arrive here today. Like you are a product of a billion factors in your background. You have a family of origin that you came from. There are things that you love about yourself and things that you hate about yourself that you don't quite understand. Well, all of that is wrapped up in the highs and lows of your life, the wins and losses of your life, the way your parents decided to discipline or not discipline, their attentiveness or non-attentiveness. There, there are all these issues that have led you to this moment. You are a product of a long, complex history, and I think this is extraordinary and beautiful. The Bible tells us in Psalm 139 that you have been wonderfully and beautifully made, that, that your physical makeup and, and your personality type actually was woven into you in your mother's womb, according to that text, for the days that the Lord has made for you. We read in Acts 17 that not only uh, were you uniquely wired, but you were uniquely placed. In Acts 17, we, we found out that the times in which we would live and the, the boundaries of our habitation, actually the Lord was involved in that, and he was involved in that according to that text, so that men might seek him and find him, though he is not far from us. So you've been uniquely wired, you've been uniquely placed. And then the Bible wants to argue that you, yes you, are uniquely gifted, that God Almighty, has put a treasure in you that when found and unleashed brings about purpose, meaning, and beauty in your life. That This is you. This is your story. Like a snarky thing um, my dad will say about this next generation, not because he knows them, but because he reads a lot of stuff he probably shouldn't be reading. He's like a bunch of snowflakes. And he means it in a derogatory term. But there's actually something true about it. Like, look, look at me real quick. There has never been anyone like you ever in the history of the world. There will never be anyone like you ever again in the history of the world. You are uniquely and beautifully you. Wonderful, amazing. God has done a profound thing in you being you. And God has not and will not waste a single high, a single low, a single heartbreaking event, a, a single victory in your life. He weaves all of it into a tapestry of grace and mercy. You are a sight to behold. You really are just a sight to behold. And, and one of the things the gospel wants to convince you of is that that's true. Not in a way uh, uh, that you might elevate your self-esteem. The Bible's not interested in your self-esteem. It's interested in you seeing and acknowledging the goodness and beauty of the creator God of the universe. You've been fearfully and wonderfully made. This is why even Ephesians 10 says that, that you are God's workmanship. The, the Greek word pomea means like you're God's poetry. Like, like how has poetry happened? Thoughtfully, slowly, I guess. I'm not a, a poet. Like, like it's well thought of and there you are. Like you have been well thought of, uniquely wired, and, and, and here's what's crazy. It, at the same time that I want you to know that you've been uniquely wired, uniquely placed, and uniquely gifted, fearfully and wonderfully made, the poetry of God, if you stay there, and that's the only story you know, you are going to be prone to bitterness, cynicism, anxiety, and some depression, because all of that has been intentionally and purposefully divinely placed in you, not for you, but for according to the scriptures, the days that he has for you, the gifts he gave you for, for the common good, that you have been uniquely wired, uniquely placed, uniquely gifted for something bigger than you. And so the first place we're starting is our story, your story. You've got a unique one. Yours is not the same as your neighbor's. Your neighbor's isn't the same as yours. Uniquely wired, placed, and gifted. One of my favorite things if you and I ever get to sit down over a meal or I just want to know your story. I want to know where you came from. I'm going to try to move the conversation away from 
uh, maybe more trivial things. I want to know, uh, how, how do you grew up? Tell me about, you know, navigating this season of your life that's those awkward seasons for all of us. How did you transition here? I want to hear your story. It will help me understand you, and I want you to hear mine. It will help you understand me. It, it, like, you, you're a product of a lot of complex things that brought us to this moment. I always find it to be profoundly beautiful to watch how God pulls us from such various backgrounds with various experiences and lands us in the same family of faith. So that's part one is your story. It's a beautiful, right, good thing. And then you've got our story. Uh, and by our story, I mean the story of the village church, because it's some way, whether you're in the room or you're watching online, you, you have intersected your story and our story have kind of hit in this moment. Maybe this is your first time ever being here. And so welcome, you're, you're about to interact with our story. Just like you as an individual didn't spontaneously show up here today, neither did we as a church. We have a history that kind of makes us like we are. We, we have our own vibe, our own feel, our own sense of values, and those are driven by our story. Those are driven by our background. You, you'll, you'll be able to see and understand some things about how we are, why we are, as I read through some of our history. In 1845, the Southern Baptist Convention Missions Organization was founded, and they had a desire to see the Mesos and Comanche and other Indian tribes come to know Jesus, so they sent missionaries out to these plains, uh, and, and not only were there missionaries, but also other settlers, and, and so they, they were sharing the gospel with settlers, they were sharing the gospel with Indians, and in 1869, just right down, literally right down the road from here, the, the Holford Prairie Church was born, 13 people uh, built it. It was built where Old Hall Cemetery is now by McGee Lane, you know where that is, over by First Baptist Church of Louisville. That, that's literally where it was. That cemetery is, if you're a little bit old school in here, churches used to have cemeteries in, in, their, in their property. And it was a way to remind the saints that we're only here but for a minute. They were all moving towards this moment. So they just like to have the, the cemetery out back. I think there's new laws around that now, but uh, that, that's where that cemetery came from. It was a part of this Holford Prairie Church. And then you got to know, man, that, that God really worked in that little prairie church. They exploded from like 13 to 37 people. And when they hit 37, they just thought, we've got to move this thing in town. And, and so they moved to downtown Louisville and became the first Baptist church of Louisville, Texas. What's funny now, if you know where First Baptist Louisville is, they're actually back towards where they originally began as a prairie church all those years ago when nothing was here. Uh, and, and First Baptist Louisville uh, planted a church in 1962 called the First Baptist Church, of, or no, Lakeland Baptist Church, which is there on Interstate 35. Um, and, and then in 1978, Ben Smith, who was the pastor of Lakeland, a tremendous man of God believed that the heathens over in Highland Village <laughs> needed a, a church that could minister in this unique, because I don't know if you know this, one of the reasons we're Highland Village is because a lot of people from Highland Park actually had lake houses here on the lake. So we became Highland Village. We were the, the, the little Highland Park village out by uh, the river. And so Ben wanted to plant a church to reach men and women that were moving into this area. And so a group of men and women come and they plant Highland Village First Baptist Church, which is, by the way, us. And these men and women, they so have a desire to reach and see this community reach that our Martin building, I don't know if you've ever been to the old campus, the Martin building, they actually built that thing with their hands. They did. They didn't hire somebody. They built. Let me show you. Like, this is like a movie. That light is from cars that they pulled into a field. Nothing there. It was just a field. Those the shores weren't there. The, the suburbs weren't there. These guys are just, they're just like in a field. These guys work, the, the tech is still there. These guys work 70-hour weeks and then grabbed a shovel. Men, women, children. Like, you, you could give a child a skill saw back then and just let them run. <laughs> Nobody even watched them. Is that thing plugged in? Of course it's plugged. How's he supposed to work if it's not plugged in? Right, we didn't like have to find a place for the kids before we did manual labor. We just brought them. Single moms and kids and moms and dads built it with their bare hands. This is, like, this is our story. This is our roots, a prayerful desire for God to move profoundly in this area. So much more I could talk about in that season. 
but the sermon can't be two hours, like six of you would be like, yeah, it can, and everyone else would be like, absolutely, it's already too long. <laughs> On Wednesday night, December 4th, 2002, I walked into my very first prayer meeting as the pastor of Highland Village First Baptist Church. I bought a new outfit from Banana Republic. Uh, the, the dress here back then was business casual, was slacks with a button up, you, you know, tucked in the whole thing. Um, and so I, I didn't own stuff like that. And so I bought a, a fit uh, from Banana Republic and I showed up, uh, there was about 40 people there that night. Um, and, and they were a bit shell-shocked. Uh, one of the things that I didn't have time for is the village actually had, um, they, they, they had this moment where they kind of swelled to about 500 people, and then there were some significant things happened that, that caused the church uh, to shrink and begin to collapse in on itself. I don't have time for all of that, but it left them shell-shocked and disoriented, and, and I would argue a little nervous to risk uh, and so there were about 40 of us that night, and I was just trying to cast vision prayerfully. And, and so I said to that group that had so wet the, the carpet with tears, asking for God to work and move. Uh, I just said, right now, you and I sit in the middle of a community where there are tens of thousands of people who don't know Jesus, aren't interested in Jesus, or maybe if they do, he's kind of just like a, a little side thing they've attached to their life, but certainly not King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And God will use us if we prayerfully seek his face. Those men and women will come to join us here, worship King Jesus here, and whole generations and bloodlines will be changed forever if we will prayerfully step in into obedience for all that God has for us. Now, for the next 10 years, we grew by a thousand a year. And that might sound awesome to you. It was, if you were here, it was a nightmare. Not only are we growing by a thousand a year, but half the people that were growing by, in fact, probably 80% of the people that were growing by, they're like 23. You want to grow by 10,000, 23 to 26 year olds in a decade long? No, you don't. You, you do not. Man, back in those days, if you were 37 and I saw you, I'd be like, you got to help me. You got to. Get in here, help me, right? You're looking around, I don't know, is this a kid's church? Oh my gosh, it's not a kid's church, please help me. Please don't go where there are people your age. Help me here and now. Some of you are here because I literally had that conversation with you. Help me, please. And then we were running six services a weekend, two Saturday night, two Sunday morning, two Sunday night. I think somebody probably told me that was a dumb idea back then. I'm fairly certain I couldn't hear it. 28-year-old Matt struggled to hear things at times. And, and we did it, and we just hit the breaking point. Um, and so we called the church to six weeks of prayer and fasting. We called it Venture. Uh, it's literally, I don't know what else is ahead of me, but that, that, right now that is the highlight of my 21 years here at the Village Church. on Wednesday, We'd fast all day Wednesday. We'd meet on Wednesday night. We always turned away from that. That's the only time in my, my life here that we've had too many people show up after fasting to pray. Uh, and then we just worship. We ask God to, to accomplish and give us reprieve and relief in a way that only God could get credit for. We, we didn't want to be able to teach other churches how to do it. We just want to go. We prayed, and God answered. And two days later, I got a call um, from the pastor of Grace Temple um, in Denton. That, that campus literally sits on the campus of UNT. UNT uses the parking lot during the week, and he's like, we would love um, to become the Village Church North. Um, he used the word marinate. I don't, that was never my word. And uh, I was just like, well, how about this? How about I stand up on Sunday morning and go, look, if you're driving north from north of the bridge, why don't you stay there and, and help us revitalize that church? We've got a, another worship leader. We can head up that way. But, but for reasons that are way too long to get into, he's like, that, that's not going to work. And so the multi-site era of the village church began. Uh, at its height, we were five campuses running about 15,000 on the weekends. When, when you got near Christmas and Easter, that would ooch towards 20,000. And, and we began to yet again pray about what the Lord had. Are we going to keep doing campuses? We're still planting churches. What do you have for us? And we got the strangest prompting that we were actually supposed to roll all of that off into autonomous churches. And so we had to come to you. You can't, yeah, our, our bylaws are gonna help us not give away $60 million worth of real estate and other assets without you saying we can. It's not that kind of ecclesiology, right? And so we came to you with this 
campaign where we weren't asking for money. We're like, we, we think God wants us to give all of this uh, away to be about his kingdom more than we're about our own name and our own brand. And ever, instead of an ever increasing mega giga thing, we feel called to like so into the Metroplex, autonomous, highly contextualized, biblically serious, spiritually alive, zealously missional churches. And, and you guys were amazing. Like who says give away 60 million plus worth of assets and real, you do, you did, you love the kingdom. I love that about you. And so we started and we rolled all of them off. In fact, a couple of them are actually in their own campaigns right now. They're, they're growing themselves. They're seeing people come to know Jesus. They're making disciples. Like, like there's one of those churches that collapsed after they took me off the screen. In fact, I still have a little bit of offense that they all voted at over 90% to do the thing. Like Denton, I mean, everybody gets Denton, right? Bunch of hippies. They're like, it's like, you know, I've showered today. I don't really work there. But, um, but man, like Denton's like 93%. We should do this. And then everybody else was higher. You can't get church people to agree on 90% of anything. These days, even Christ as Messiah might be controversial, but not our church. Like every one of them, over 90%. We should do this. We should do this. We should do this. And they're thriving it's a beautiful season of our church, and that's led us to this moment. That's a bit of our history. If you've never understood some of why we do what, like this is what's playing in the background, and that's just some of it. We've got a lot more, but I don't have the time. Now, if you stay in your story, and I've said it this way for 20 years, the more you make your life about you, the more miserable you're going to be. Just 100% true. I, I think it's true in all sorts. It's certainly true biblically speaking and not that the Bible needs any help, but psychologically and sociologically speaking, the more you're a navel-gazing king of your own soul, captain of your ship, the more miserable you're gonna be. What kind of pressure are you putting on yourself? Like what, you've gotta determine the moral universe? Some of you don't even have a sense of direction. If it wasn't for your phone, you'd have been lost trying to get here. And you're gonna build a moral universe? Like we've been duped to believe that, that what I think about life should be supreme. That's asinine. Think about the different seasons of your life that you believed different things that now you're thanking God that that didn't work its way all the way to the foundation of your life. Really? You're the king of, you, you're the king of the universe. Like you know what's best. Come on, man. No one's betrayed you as much as you have. No one's lied to you like you. No one's failed you like you. Really? Your utmost? No, no, no. The, the more we do that, the more we're prone to everything in this passage. What am I going to eat? What am I going to drink? What am I going to wear? What am I going to live? What's going to happen? Why is this? I hate the, why is it? It, it's the default we have to operate on because it's too small. You're, and here's what I'd say about the village. We're, we're too small. There better be another story. There better be another story than your personal one, which I think is spectacular, and our corporate one, which I think is spectacular. The good news is those stories only function correctly when they're oriented around the story. So let, let, here's how I'm gonna tell our story. The story. The only story that all stories flow up into, right? Creation, fall, redemption, and then let, let me go walk over here real quick. It's fine. It's fine, guys. It's fine. Restoration. There it is. I, I, sometimes I say consummation. Sometimes I say, so I, I just wanted to be true. So let's start with creation. The Bible tells us that out of an overflow of love and perfection within the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, pours out of that dance between the Godhead on the canvas of creation and creates everything that is. Creates it at a macro level, creates it at a micro level. There's nothing huge that he did not speak into being and there's nothing at the atomic level and the particles inside of an atom and a particle inside of the particles. It's like dark matter stuff that God, he, he spoke it all into being and, and then the Bible tells us that in the middle of that creation, he, he creates this place called Eden, and it's like a, his throne room. It's this place where it's ordered and true and beautiful and good, and he creates Adam and Eve, and he puts them in that garden. You need to think of Adam and Eve as like kind of a king and a queen placed 
in the garden. He gives them dominion and authority. And he tells them, hey, make go, fill the earth and subdue it, right? Make the rest of the wild, kind of dark, scary world ordered and beautiful like this. And I will be with you unfettered. I will be with you, not by faith, but by sight. You will see me. I will be with you. Fill the earth and subdue it. And they failed horrifically. They failed horrifically. And so in the fall, right, this is act two. In the fall, everything is broken at a macro level, at a micro level. And on top of that, you and I now are born with a bent that the Bible calls iniquity. We are not born with a bent towards righteousness. We are born with a bent towards unrighteousness. And everyone with a toddler said, there it is. Yeah. Like I, I have a kid who won't be named that used to bite other kids, shove them, snatch things out of their hands. And I just want to, before God, in, in earshot of my wife, say they did not learn that in their environment. Never screamed and snatched something out of Lauren's hand and shoved her to the ground. That, that was not environmental. It was just like, and I know we're kind of giggling, but there was something in this kid's head that when I get frustrated and when it doesn't go my way, violence is the answer. That's iniquity. That's a bent towards. It, it wasn't, let me pray for my brother or sister. It, it was, that's mine and I'm going to take it by force. Right? Th this is iniquity. It also shows us that we have a real, sneaky, conniving, evil enemy that's out to destroy us. We, we see this in chapter two. And then chapter three is redemption. And, and here's what you see. Redemption or everything being made right. All the brokenness and death and disease and pain and loss and perversion and wickedness is gonna be set right. We're gonna be redeemed from it. We're gonna be pulled out of it. And we get the promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that God is going to redeem through this people that he creates in the nation of Israel. And so God delivers Israel out of bondage and slavery, and he gives them the moral law. He gives them the moral law of God, which is this is how humanity flourishes. Obey this, and you will flourish. He literally says in Exodus 15, you will be for me a kingdom of priests. I'm going to set you right in the middle of the nations of your day, the superpowers on earth. And if you will follow me and be obedient to these commands, you will flourish in a way that make the nations look in and say, surely God is among them. Surely he is good. Surely he is true. Surely he is beautiful. And they failed. Every king, every prophet, every generation catastrophically failed in doing this. The Apostle Paul would talk about it this way, that, that weak as we are in the flesh, we could not do. Therefore, God did in the sending of his son. And so at the right time and in the right place, God sends the second person of the Trinity, Jesus, the Christ, to earth to be the king that we could not be to be the reigning ruler that we could not be, to be the prophet that our prophets could not be, and to fulfill the story of Israel. Now, why do I think that's important? Well, I, I think that's important because this is the story that the gospel's embedded in. Are you tracking with me? This is the story that the gospel is embedded in. And so when, and if you don't know your Old Testament well, you'll blow past things in the New Testament that are so significant that if you're not mindful of them, you might buy into a whole different version of Christianity. Like Jesus is called the son of man. That means he's supernatural. He's 100% God and 100% man. That he is called the Messiah. That means he's the anointed one. That, that all the authority of heaven has been given to him. He's called the Christ. He's the savior. On repeat, Jesus is the king, the king that David couldn't be, the king that Josiah wasn't, the king that all the other kings before failed in, the prophet that all the other prophets had failed. He has succeeded where no one else has. He is the king of kings and lord of lords, and he talks like a king. And that's what gets me a little anxious about where some of us might be today. Let, let me give you an example. This is Matthew 16. Like Jesus, he just makes these big old asks. Matthew 16, starting verse 24. Then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. 
For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Now, everybody tends to use this next verse towards lost people, but I want you to remember, he's talking to his disciples. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? Do, do you see it? Like Jesus is making kingly commands here. He, he's not your homeboy. And, and if you rightly receive the message of salvation, I, I think you can be saved, but the life Life, life, real life that Christ has promised you is only found in experience in submission to his kingly reign over our lives. We don't have an errand boy. We have a king who rules over our life. And if we will ever get into the beauty and mercy and grace and power and strength that he's promised for us, it will be forged through obedience to his kingly reign. And I'm telling you, I meet with people all the time, even here, it kills me, like who, who think Jesus isn't working for them, who are not following him in any way. It's just like they got this like fire insurance tucked in their back pocket and then ringing that bell for Jesus to let them get that, you know, that, that raise at work or ringing that bell so that God would fix their kid or ringing that bell. So it's just like we want to make Jesus our errand boy. And he's going, you want life, 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 life? Real life, deep life, meaningful life? Come and die. Come, come and die. You, you know who does know how your life should work? Me. You know who knows how to pull from you that treasure I put in you? Me. And, and this is where our personal story, and God help us, even the story of this church better tuck up under his kingly reign. Jesus is the redeemer of our souls. And then this has an end. So there, there is an ending point in history. It's not just gonna keep going on and on and on forever. There is a finish line, and we call that finish line restoration. The Bible says when Christ returns and all things have been made new, here's what you can expect. The deserts will bloom with roses. The mountains will produce sweet wine. And in the Hebrew, it says, and the Baptist will be cool with it. I just made that up, it's not true. They won't, even there, even there, they'll wanna argue. The wolf will lie down with the lamb, that the lion will chew hay like the oxen, that there'll be no more chaos. Can you believe that? No more chaos, no tears, no disease, no death, no mourning, no crying. I love this one. No remembrance of former things. There's some things I'd like to forget. Some things I'd like to forget. Now, right now, what I'm having to do is just keep taking them back to Jesus. I don't want to dwell here. I want to hand this to you. I want to hand this. But this is like, oh, man, that's not even, I don't even remember that. Everything's put in its right perspective and placed, brought about by an eternal perspective that's just really hard to do from here, right? I love this passage. In fact, it's the thing that has me eager for either the return of Christ or my own transition into the next life. Not that I'm in a hurry. Revelation 21, 22, and I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. So this, th we might miss this because we're modern people. Um, temples were those places where people believed the presence of God was there, and they would come make an offering to that God to put that God in some kind of debt. Are you tracking with me? That's why the Tower of Babel is such a disaster, right? They're like, we're going to make God come down and serve us. And he was like, oh, I'll come down, all right. And so this is, the temple had the manifest presence of God in it. That's what temples were. And this is going, you don't need no temple. You'll be right in the heart of it. So you've got this idea of a dance between God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Like the Holy Spirit's always like, Jesus is amazing. And Jesus is like, stop it. You're amazing. And God the Father's incredible. And the Father's like, both you guys are great. And there's this like dance of perfect love. And this passage says, you don't go to church for that anymore. You don't have your quiet time for that. Like you just live right in the present. You join that dance forevermore in a literal place with literal resurrected bodies, like with a job, without toil, without, I don't, that's way too much detail for the amount of time I have left. And you remember when I started this sermon by saying, I want to lay in front of you an invitation that I, I think you should say yes to and then go look at your calendar and go, can we make this work? Revelation 22, 17, the spirit and the bride say, Come. And let the one who hears say, come. 
And, and let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. See, the invitation that's on the table for you is to come out of your own story. What's in the invitation to us is come out of, or maybe with our story as a collective people. So with our story as individuals, with our collective story as a family of faith, come all the more into the only story that actually is plain that matters. This will help us make sense of our own personal stories. And it will certainly help us make sense for our corporate story as a local congregation. But the more we try to just go, no, I'm just going to live here, I'm just going to live here, and disregard the story, the, the more we miss the whole point of our own personals as well as our corporate family story. And, and so for really the last several years, we've had this picture that's driving us forward. We think this is what this will look like here. If we all the more, more and more of us move towards with our story into or with our individual stories into our corporate story towards the only story that is, this is our vision for what that would look like. We just have called it our 2030 vision. I'm gonna read it. We are a welcoming home to thousands of people seeking Jesus Christ and growing in the grace of the gospel. We are a diverse community of men and women, young and old, single and married, discovering together our identity, purpose, and belonging within God's good design. We impact thousands of kids and students week in and week out. With all our efforts wholly dependent on God, we make disciples across all ages. Every stage of life has a portion in the church. We celebrate 300 baptisms every year. We are a refuge for the broken and suffering to receive hope and care and a place where God heals and enriches marriages. We demonstrate the ministry of presence as we rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. We send wholehearted leaders and disciples into their homes, into neighborhoods, into our city, and to the nations. We have planted and revitalized 30 churches and have 100 goers reaching 10 unreached people groups. We have seen more than 50,000 individuals reached by the gospel through our campuses, church plants, revitalization efforts, and goers. We have generously resourced millions of people across the globe as we share the gifts that God has entrusted to us. Every day, in all spaces, through each season of life, we are joyfully building beyond ourselves, living the greater story together, and creating a kingdom legacy for generations to come. Now, all the other stuff around this building campaign is legitimate. Like, you know, like we could just do this. How many of you have been turned away before? Like you came to church and you ended up not getting in? Okay, I mean, keep your hand up for a second. Let's look at this. Look around the room. I mean, this, this has been us for 20 years. And here's what's wild. If you go here, like we're your church home, you know the 1115 doesn't start at 1115. You know it starts at 1030. And if you go to the nine, you know it doesn't start at nine. It starts at 8.15. And, and even in that, like, it'll, it'll break my heart to consider, like, people who are just trying to find hope for a second. Just is life falling apart. Well, let's, let's, let's go. We've got friends that go to the village. Let's go and see what's going on there. And, and to get turned away? Like that, that's got to change. So I'm not telling you, hey, if you build it, they'll come. I think that's nonsensical. I think that's bad stewardship. I'm telling you, and you know, we've been turning away for two decades. Like, gosh, even last week, we announced two classes last week. They were both completely full by Tuesday. Like we are just out of room everywhere you look. And so here's, here's my ask today, that you begin to pray about what you and your family might be able to do across a three-year period of time to help us hit this goal of ultimately $50 million. That, that sounds like a, a high price tag, but it's the cost of concrete and steel. That, that's not dictated by us. We're, we're not building like some sort of uh, mega giga thing here. We're just trying to go, we should be able to park without having to risk running across a thoroughfare. We should have a place where we could sit down for a second and minister to someone and receive ministry. We, we wanna, we're, not, we're just not, we're not a bougie place, I don't think. But, but we've got to make some moves here so that we continue to minister. So I'm just asking you to pray. I'm just asking you to pray. 
Hey, but Lauren and I will give the largest gift we've ever given towards this. That's on the heels of a wedding and a kid graduating from high school. There's a lot of reasons for us to not be generous right now. And, and we're going to push through that and just trust that the Lord will make a way. I'm just asking you to pray and consider five weeks from now, we'll have a big service where we kind of lay all of that down. And listen, I, I, I need to say that that's necessary. It's no small thing. I'm not trying to diminish it. I am far more interested this morning in you understanding how your story and our story folds into the story and you to move all the more into Jesus' kingly reign over your life. I just think there's so much for you. I think you might be running in second gear and, and you got the whole, I'm just trying to be the, the Holy Spirit today and just go, oh gosh, shift up. Shift into fourth, I promise you. It'll blow your mind, man. You get to fifth gear. You, you won't, I mean, there's so much for you right readily available if you'll just trust him, but to trust him means to obey him. To trust him means to obey him. So, so let's do this. Would you do me a favor? Why don't you bow your heads and close your eyes? What, what would it look like? What would it look like today? What step of obedience? Where, where are you doing what you know is wrong? Or where are you not doing where you know is right? I want you to be practical Ask the Holy Spirit if you can't think of anything. What does it look like to all the more come under his kingly reign? Father, I bless these men and women in the name of Jesus, those watching from home and those who are in the room. King David said it rightly and beautifully, the boundaries have fallen for us in pleasant places. Your burden is easy, your yoke is light. Thank you. And yet it's a scary thing to fully trust you and so we, we ask that you'd grant us the courage I thank you for even the little steps that have been popping up in the heads of people that this is something they need to do to be obedient to you, to come under your reign, to stop treating you like you're an errand boy, but the king of glory, the fulfillment of all the promises, the redemption of the world, the, the renewing force of the universe. Help us. We need you. We love you. It's for your beautiful name I pray. Amen.